Okay, so hello everyone, and uh, we hope that you're having a great day wherever you are in the world. I'm Will from UserSnap, and I want to thank you for joining us for the special webinar session we have for you today. Today, our special guest is Gabriel Steinhardt, and he's going to discuss the fundamentals of market research for product management and product marketing. Gabriel is a developer of practical tools and methodologies that increase product managers' productivity. He's the developer of the Black Blot, Black Blot Product Managers Toolkit, PMTK. Uh, product management methodology, and it's a globally adopted best practice. You can check Gabriel and his PMTK methodology out on LinkedIn. And one note before we get going, uh, please feel free to send in your questions during the webinar in the general chat to everyone, and we will address them during the Q&A. Uh, and that is all from my side, and let's begin then. Take Thank it away. You. Thank you. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, thank you all for joining in today, and it's a pleasure for me to be here with you. My name is Gabriel Steinhardt, and this presentation is about market research and product management. Our agenda for today is first to discuss product management very briefly, and also its association with market research. We'll move on to market research, define it, and we'll talk about the two main components which I consider the components that comprise market research, which is gathering market information and data collection. And we'll conclude, of course, with a summary. So first, let's talk a little bit about product management. Now, I was asked a couple of weeks ago to create something or write something, which is product management manifesto. It's really just a summary of the PMTK methodology. And in that manifesto, there's a definition of product management, and we're going to flow and use this definition for the sake of this presentation. So product management is defined or stated, it's stated as being a market-focused corporate activity that goes and looks for potentially profitable market problems, and then communicates those problems in a format and language that developers understand so that the developers can offer us with solution to those problems in the form of new features or modification of existing features or even new products. Now, the centerpiece over here, the focus of product management is that it's market focused. It's not product focused, it's not technology focused, it's not project focused. Now, assuming this, we can derive from this definition, the definition of a product manager. Well, a product manager would be a market expert, not a product expert, not a project expert, not a technology expert, expert who goes and seeks uh, profitable market problems and communicates them in a language that developers understand so they can offer us with a solution. Another way of looking at it is that the product manager is a market expert. That is the core of being a, mark, a product manager, which is a strategic role in the problem space. Now, the question is, how does one become a market expert? Well, the answer to that is probably, and there's several, but it's probably something called research. Now, the very generic definition of research is the gathering and analysis of data and information. Data is just raw numbers and facts. Information is data that's organized in a meaningful way that we can draw insights and conclusions from it. So that's the difference between data and information. So how does one become a market expert? Research. And if we go online and we do a Google search, we'll find all kinds of different types of research. Some of it is relevant to what we're gonna to do today. So let me just briefly discuss these. Exploratory research is where we don't have a good idea of what we're actually looking for. So it's like going into the jungle. Let's see what we can find. So we're going to go and explore and seek information in order to better define the situation of the problem. Descriptive research is when we have a situation or condition or population, and we want more in-depth information about it to describe it better. Experimental research is a type of research that is done through a series of experiments or tests looking for cause and effect. It's mostly found in the pharmaceutical industry where they do research in a series of tests, but we can also do this in business. Competitive research, which is also very important, we'll talk about this later, is just a gathering of information on the competition. In politics, this is called opposition research. Primary research and secondary research is just a characterization of who does the research. So primary research is where we collect the data ourselves 
And secondary research is when we acquire the data, whether for money or for free, from somebody else who has collected the data. But this is what we find on Google, on the internet. And we're going to focus on something which is called market research. So what exactly is market research? Well, market research is, and this is the definition of in PMTK that relates to product management. So market research is the systematic gathering, recording, and analyzing of data information on market problems. Those market problems that we said are going to be answered with features or products or so forth. Now, there's a statement here that says systematic gathering. So it's not just research, but it's systematic gathering. Systematic gathering means that there's somebody constantly at the company with their hand on the pulse of the market, gathering the information and analyzing it. This process, which is called market intelligence, and it's basically just market research that's constantly being done, ongoing, all the time, in real time. So what exactly is this uh, market intelligence process where somebody is doing research all the time is supposed to do for us? It's supposed to build something which is called a body of knowledge. And what exactly is a body of knowledge? Well, the body of knowledge is what we need in order to become those market experts in product management. And that is comprised of something that we're going to call the three C's. But by the way, if you go online, there's four C's and five C's. But I'm not a professor, this is not university, and this is, we just, we need to do the job. So the three C's are the customers, the competitors, and the complementary. Customer means we understand, need to understand whether it's companies, the companies, the users, the buyers, the segmentation, their behavior, their thinking, their patterns, whatever it is, we need to understand primarily the customers and how, what kind of a problem they have and how they want to solve it. Competitors are entities, often companies, that compete with us in solving that problem. And we need to understand their strategies, their products, their technologies, the key people working there, their press releases, and anything about the competition that we can also draw information from that and uh, make changes to our strategies and products based on the competition. Complementary is everything surrounding the customers and the competitors. It means the government, regulation, suppliers, distribution chains, economic trends, cultural trends, anything happening in the market itself. So these three C's create something which is called the body of knowledge, and that will make us a market expert. Now, what do we need this body of knowledge for, this market expertise for? Now, obviously, it's in order to make product decisions and business decisions, but there's something more than that. What we want the body of knowledge is to help us look into the future, to forecast market problems and needs before they materialize, before the customers recognize them, and begin developing the products, the services, the features for these future needs and problems. So when they materialize and manifest themselves, we will be there already with a solution, answering the need, and also beating the competition. So there's a reason why there's an image here of money, because this is often how you become first to market and a leader and make money and so forth. Now, at technology-driven companies, often the engineers and the executives are focused on technology. And therefore, they appreciate technology and te technological knowledge. And therefore, they invest less time and money in market research. But I'm sure you've heard this many times. Customers don't want technology. They want their solution. They want a problem. Their problem solved. They want a solution to their problems. So I'm going to put forward a position that seems kind of stating the obvious. But uh, this position is that companies first have to understand the need and then develop the product instead of the reverse. And as an antithesis to everything that we just said, let's take a look at a company who was successful without doing any market research whatsoever. So Akira, Akia Morita, which is this gentleman over here on the right, and Isuro Buka were two post-World War II engineers in Japan. They joined forces together and they decided to build a series of products. This is the first Sony product. It's a rice cooker. It failed. 
They had to recall it. They sold 100 units and they had to recall it and give the money back. They deviated what today people like to call they pivoted. They pivoted towards something completely different, which was uh, building an inexpensive tape recorder. And they were able to sell these tape recorders in large volume to the Japanese school system and make money. Then they pivoted again to microelectronics. And this product here, the TR55, which stands for transistor radio from 1955, is the product that made them successful in, in an international household name. Now, a lot of these products, as you can see from this short uh, introduction, and many of the other products that Sony introduced, such as the Walkman and the Discman, were immense successes, were successful. And they did all of this without market research, relying on intuition. But this is like throwing the dice. It's very risky, and it's a probabilistic approach. And we're always trying to minimize risk. But we need to look at this example because there are people who will point to these examples and others that we're going to show later on in this presentation and dismiss market research, indicating that here you can succeed without investing time, money, and effort in doing market research. Here's a stat from a gentleman by the name of Cooper, a professor in the US. He provides us with a lot of statistics on product management. And he says in one of his book, and this is a quote, market studies, market research, which everybody says is fundamental to success, are absent in too many projects. And his study, or one of the studies that he quotes over there, demonstrates that market research was simply not done in 75% of new product development projects. Now, I'm not sure that this is the reason why those products would fail or could fail, but it's an interesting stat to look at. So here is a position that we're gonna just put forward first. And that is, if you do believe in market research and you do believe in first researching the market and then going and building the product instead of the other way around, then you need to have some kind of a market intelligence process, which at the core of which there's somebody doing market research, building a body of knowledge, the three C's for the products or the product lines that you manage or have at the company. And if you're a product manager, you need to develop your domain expertise to become a market expert by um, learning the three C's. So let's move on now to the first component of what I deem to be uh, part, the major part of market research, and this is the gathering of market information. Okay, so there's a concept in computer science which is called GIGO, garbage in, garbage out. And the idea is that the quality of the output from a system is directly proportional and related to the quality of whatever you input into the system. And this concept can also be applied to the product world and the business world. The quality of the product decisions and the business decisions we make are profoundly dependent on the quality of information that is used in order to make those decisions. Now, where do we get information in order to make decisions? So there are two categories. There's free and for fee. And under free, by the way, I included some low cost alternatives. So today, actually, everything is on the, on the internet, including the books, the magazines, and the newspapers, which are now published digitally. You can also find information from reports coming from industry trade associations, which are organizations that group together several manufacturers or players in a particular industry, like the automotive industry, the pharmaceutical industry, the airline industry, and so forth. And they publish report on what's happening in their industry in their particular market. Now, there's a lot of information that can be found out there in all kinds of uh, odd, uh, odd places, bankruptcies and sellouts. There used to be a company called Pizza Domino, not Domino's Pizza, which is a uh, chain of uh, pizza stores in the United States. Pizza Domino went out of business and the liquidator, the lawyers, uh, decided that they want to try and attempt to sell the company as an ongoing concern, as a living company. So what they did was they sold for $1,000 the business plan and the market plan of Pizza Domino to anybody who would be a potential buyer of the company. Over 300 companies bought for $1,000 these two PDF documents. The liquidator made $300,000 from two, doc two documents, 
very easily. Nobody actually bought the company in the end and it was dismantled. So there's information there that can come from a variety of sources. Now, there are companies that you can buy from them a report about a particular product or technology or market. And those are research companies such as IDC, Gartner, Yankee, Forrester, IMR, all these companies. What these companies usually do is they take two young MBAs fresh out of business school, they give them six months to about a year to compile a report on the product technology market. And then they sell that report when it's completed for about a thousand to five thousand dollars. The thing is that you need to be a little cautious about these uh, reports because often there's a large company in the background sponsoring somehow this research and hoping that the research, uh, re the report would be favorable towards a particular technology or emerging market that just happens to coincide with their business interests. We can also find information about our market from the competition, not just by researching the competition. And particularly if the uh, competition is being publicly traded, they're obliged to publish reports, that there is information about them on the Securities and Exchange Committee. There's all kinds of financial resources uh, available that publish reports on them. And there's also analysts who work for investment companies who are constantly researching this particular market or a particular company, and they publish reports or give insights. Uh, at the time, long ago, I used to follow two uh, analysts. One was Rick Sherland. At the time, he was in Goldman Sachs. He used to cover the software industry and Microsoft and a gentleman by the name of Dan Niles who covered the semiconductor industry. These are people doing basically the same job as us, although they're directing it towards investors instead of towards products. And I would suggest that you follow the relevant analysts on either television or on YouTube. Now, there's a lot of companies who have succeeded with market research. Uh, the prime examples are companies such as Microsoft and McDonald's and Starbucks and Lego, which all are known to use market research to better understand their customers and advance their success, keep uh, customers satisfied. And uh, they acknowledge that without market research, these companies would not be able to produce and innovate, produce products and innovate them, enhance their offerings, understand the customers and solve their problems. So it's obvious from the business strategy of these particular companies that market research for them is an essential part of being successful. But quite frankly, this is boring because uh, I mean, if you subscribe to this notion, okay, so it's obvious. But again, what's more interesting is who can succeed without market research, because again, there are a lot of people who point to these examples as a, an excuse to dismiss market research. And here's an example of totally succeeding without doing any market research. Sir Clive Sinclair, a British gentleman and an, and an electronics engineer, um, decided in the early 80s, and this is his words, that the home market was ready for electronic wizardry. And without any research, pure intuition, he invested his own money with loans and everything in building some kind of a lightweight hobby computer that you could perhaps learn to program basic and Fortran programming languages on it. He called it the Sinclair ZX80 and launched it. By the end of 1980, the revenue from this uh, this product was 4.65 million pounds sterling, which adjusted to inflation is a lot of money today. The next year, he launched a product called the ZX81. By the end of 81, um, the revenue from this product was 30 million pounds sterling. So it's clear that you can be very successful and intuitively decide what the market wants, but you need to be very lucky. And this is very fortuitous. Actually, Mr. Sinclair later tried his hand in a variety of projects and they all failed. Now, it doesn't mean that intuition is wrong, but he tried the same model again and again and again and all the other projects he had failed. Now, here's a company, perhaps some of you are familiar with it, I'm sure, that 
as a matter of strategy, doesn't do business. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm sorry, as a matter of strategy, doesn't do any market research. It goes directly to building the product. And I'm going to suggest that the prime reason for all the Google product failures, and uh, until today, I think there's a count of around 170 Google product failures. This is just a handful of logos. I'm gonna say that the prime reason for these failures is a lack of understanding of the respective market, a disconnect from the market. But if you have a lot of money and you wanna play around and you can afford to lose, then go ahead and do technology driven, build a product, throw it into the market and see if it works or not. But I think that there's no shortcut here. I mean, if you don't have endless supply of money and if you don't have too much time and you want to succeed, there is no way to avoid sitting and reading and uh, learning what the market wants and becoming a market expert. So I'm gonna suggest that never assume that a market exists for your product or for your service. Always when you make product decisions or business decisions or make an assertion, make a statement, provide supporting information. So this was the section about gathering market information, which in my mind is one component of doing market research. Let's move on to data collection. There are various means of doing data collection. And we're gonna go over these with a brief slide in, a minute, in about a minute. There's interviews, observations, focus groups, questionnaires, and something called online tracking. And we're gonna talk a, bit, a little bit more about online tracking, which is very prevalent today because a lot of the products uh, that are out there have a digital interface and that allows for online tracking. We'll talk about that. So what exactly is interviews? Interview is just a conversation that you have as an interviewee with a, uh, as an interviewer with an interviewee, can be done in person or over the phone. It's customizable, responsive, um, it can deviate and then you can bring it back. The conversation allows you to ask open-ended and close questions, but this is the most expensive and time consuming. And it's also affected by the rapport, the connection that you have uh, with the interviewer. If it's a good connection, there's no personality clashes or egos involved, it works great. But if not, then the interview could be skewed. So if there's a problem over there, then we move on to something called observation. Let's not talk to them, let's just watch them. And this you can do in person or through a camera. And you're literally watching the behavior of the individual, looking at what they do, collecting the data without asking questions. But the problem over here is that whatever you're looking at, you need to place your own interpretation on what's happening. So we're always captive in our own mindset and in our frame of mind, and we need to interpret what is happening. They're not telling us. So this can be skewed as well, but now it's skewed because of us. So let's move on to another way of doing data collection. Let's talk about focus groups. Focus groups is basically just interviewing a group of people instead of just one individual. It adds the collective element as if the entire group can collectively give you an answer together as opposed to one individual. But again, wherever you have humans, then you have personality clashes, egos, people trying to dominate, whatever. So there could be some group dynamics over there and that will skew and bias the results. So we say, well, humans have all these problems and all these considerations. Let's go with something which is called questionnaires. Questionnaires is where we deliver multiple choice, usually multiple choice questionnaires, either on paper and online. Now you can give those questionnaires to 10 people, 10,000 people. And therefore you can take all that information and compile it and you get data. And then you can draw conclusions. The thing is that many times, particularly if you are giving those questionnaires to uh, customers, they know what you're trying to do. So if you're gonna ask them something like, would you be willing to pay over a thousand dollars for this new feature that we're gonna to add to our product? They know what you're trying to do. You're trying to price the product and also gauge demand. And they might skew this and give you 
an answer that better fits their, their uh, interest and less of yours. So we have over here a problem with commitment, integrity, honesty, and things like that. Now, how do we solve that? Well, one way of doing that is bribing them. Long ago, I used to, I worked at a certain company and I was at a conference and I stood at the conference asking people to fill out a questionnaire. Nobody filled out the questionnaire. So I just walked out of the conference hall, hall, conference hall went to a supermarket and bought a bag of these assorted Hershey Kit Kats and Hershey things. And then I stood over there in the conference room and said, if you want this chocolate, please complete this questionnaire. And within an hour, I completed all the questionnaires. Now, bribing them is something that's not privy to me or it's, I did not invent it. Actually, I am aware that Microsoft, at least 20 years ago, used to send people an envelope with a questionnaire in the mail and attached to that questionnaire, which was on paper, was a paper clip and attached to it was a $5 bill. So that creates uh, some more commitment and perhaps would foster more integrity in answering the questionnaire, but you need to have those $5 bills running around so you can send them to people. All of this has its advantages and disadvantages. So that is why we now come to something which is called online tracking. And online tracking is very prevalent today because a lot of products have a digital interface. And we, if we look at products like uh, websites, web applications, mobile applications, we can insert a certain type of code into the product that will transmit over a network or over the internet information of how the user interacts with the product, the usage behavior, frequency, engagement, all kinds of different terms and parameters. This creates enormous data sets and it gives us this information in, in real time. And we can funnel all this data into what's called a data tracking software that will immediately give us some averages or trends, or it will give us some information about what's happening, peaks and rises and usage. And we can also connect that to a visualization software that will see graphs and dials and all kinds of things. But here's the problem with uh, data. Data can be overwhelming. It's just masses and all the time the data is changing and you ask yourself, should I collect more data? Should I stop now? Should I rely on this particular trend? Is it going to flip itself? Should I, what kind of decisions should I make when the data is constantly growing and, and, and uh, changing? And that is why people say, you know what? I'm going to dismiss this as well. I'm going to rely on something which is myself, my intuition. And therefore we have a situation which is called data-driven because it's primarily data, not so much the information you read on the internet versus intuition-driven. So our brain is comprised of two sides, the left and the right side. And the left side is analytical and the right side is creative. And the left side is something that can create wonders. All the technology around us and all those spaceships that go, that's because of our left side of the brain. But we need to understand that people by design are emotional and irrational. And many times if the left side becomes completely overwhelmed, then they will revert to the right side. And here's a gentleman who, Steve Jobs, the founder of uh, Apple Computer, who decided that he probably knows what people want and he was successful in that. And he is going to engage primarily in intuition-driven decision-making. And he was quoted as saying, people don't know what they want. I, I and my team at Apple probably know better. And we're gonna rely on our intuition and not so much on market research and data. Now, we all are familiar with the successful products that Apple had, particularly the iPad and the iPhone. And the iPhone in particular today accounts for over 50% of Apple revenue. So it's a very successful product. However, they had a series of failures, just like Mr. Sinclair and just like with Sony. They had the Newton handheld computer that for a decade they tried to resurrect it. It did not work out. The Lisa 
a heavy slow computer that failed and in today's terms adjusted for inflation it would cost around $24,000. They had some kind of a cloud online solution. Nobody knew exactly what it was called Mobile Me. I think it came back later as iCloud. They also had a product called the G4 Cube, which was a commercial failure. It lacked a monitor, it lacked a keyboard, it was scrapped after a year. And actually the failure was so great that the Apple stock price took a dive, it went down, and did not recover for a couple of years. They also had a digital camera, this one. They also had a game console called Pippin, they didn't sell well. They also had something called the E-Mate, which was a laptop, and nobody knew if it was for business people or for kids. They even had a line of clothes in the mid eighties, which was called the Apple Collection line of clothes. So let's go back again to that uh, data overwhelming part. There's just too much information and maybe we should do like Apple and Google, just try something, forget about all the data because it's too much of it and intuition driven is very fast and it's also cheaper. It's less money. You don't need to do the research. But here's the counter argument to everything that we just said. Uh, there's a gentleman by the name of Andrew, Andrew McAfee from MIT. He did some research and there's a lot of other research and surveys done to prove this, these particular conclusions here. Intuition alone is not enough for making good decision making, particularly in business. And we find that data and algorithms will outperform human intuition in a variety of circumstances, not only in the financial sectors with trying to forecast uh, stock prices in a variety of situations. So here are the conclusions. First of all, if we're gonna rely only on intuition and emotions, then often these decisions are gonna be reactive, not proactive. And early on, we spoke about the three C's and we spoke about the body of knowledge. We wanna be forward looking. We want to forecast what's gonna happen in the future. And we cannot do it based on our emotion and intuition in our own personal experience. The second thing is that it would be prudent to use all this data and valuable data around us and not just discard or dismiss it because we don't want it. There's value to all this data out there. It is important to make decisions and perhaps to provide them with greater credibility, with credence by using data and market information, of course. So the solution over here is to find the right balance of intuition and data and decision-making. And I think that this slide demonstrates the essence of doing market research all the body of knowledge and the uh, research that we're doing and the market intelligent process, everything, all of that is in order to help us make product decisions, which are gonna be based on data, market information, and intuition, a mixture of all of these. Okay, so the summary, we're now at the summary. So the key lesson here is that, I think it is, that market research is at the core of product management. You cannot do product management just relying on your intuition, gambling every time, hoping that you will be lucky or not. Familiarity with the markets is crucial in order to minimize the risk and increase the chances of success. And the way to do that, the bridge to becoming a market expert is by conducting market research in what we call the um, in to conduct market research. So if you want to learn more about this, then we have a course called Data Driven Decision Making for Product Managers. What we covered until here is just the tip of the iceberg. And as a natural extension to that, take a look at the Use and Snap platform. It is a platform for collecting product insights and customer feedback. I can assure you it's far better than how I used to organize all the market information in Excel and inside my Outlook uh, folders. So what we did today was we spoke about product management and its association with market research. We spoke about market research, we defined it, and we spoke about the two main components of doing market research, which is the reading part, 
gathering market information, and the data collection part, which you can do in a variety of ways. And now we're in the summary. If anybody has any questions, then you can reach me on the Black Belt website or through my profile on LinkedIn. Now, I wanna thank you all for joining in this presentation today. I hope you found it interesting, perhaps a little entertaining and insightful. Hope you gain some insights about market uh, research and a well-balanced view on the pros and the cons of doing market research. At this opportunity, I would also like to thank User Snap for the cooperation in setting up this webinar and for Will Perlmuter for his help in bringing all this uh, webin all this uh, this webinar to you. So I think we have now a couple of moments for Q and A, and I'll be happy to answer any questions if anybody has any. Yeah, thanks a lot, Gabriel. I really appreciate the, the presentation. We do have a few questions. Uh, if anyone has additional questions, feel free to either pose them in the Q&A section, the chat section, or you can raise your hand and uh, we, can, we could give you the opportunity to say it out loud for yourself.